Thank you, Representative Lynch. The House will come to order. Please join Representative Judah in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Shebel, please call the roll. Representatives Amabile, Bacon, Rep. Bacon is excused. Baisley, Benavides, Rep. Benavides is excused. Burnett, Bird, Bockenfeld, Basenecker, Bradfield, Caravale, Carver, Catlin, Cutter. Doherty, she's here. Duran, Representative Duran is of here. Esgar, Exum, Froelich is here. Geithner, Gonzalez Gutierrez. Gonzalez Gutierrez is excused. Gray. Here. Hanks. Here. Herod. Holtorf. Hooten. Oh, Rep. Hooten is here. Judah. Here. Kennedy. Here. Kip. Here. Larson. Here. Lindsay. Here. Lantine. Luck is excused. Lynch, McCluskey, McCormick, McKean, Rep. McKean is excused. McLaughlin, Michelson, Janae is excused. Molika is here. Neville. Neville's excused Ortiz. Here. Pelton is excused. Pico. Ransom. Rich. Ricks. I'm here. Roberts. Sandridge. Here. Sirota. Snyder. Soper. Here. Sullivan. Here. Tipper. Uh, Representative Tipper is excused <laughs> to tone. So Valdez A. Is excused Valdez D. Van Beber. Van Winkle. Here. Weissman, Will, Williams, here. Woodrow, Representative Woodrow is excused, Woog, Young, and Mr. Speaker. Fifty-four present, eleven excused. We barely have a quorum. Representative Judah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the journal of Monday, March 14th, be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. Thank you, Representative Judah. Members, you have heard the motion that the journal be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. That was equal. I still have it. The motion is approved. Announcements and introductions. Representative Kip McLaughlin to tone. And Hooten. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, Representatives.
Hooten and McLaughlin and Tone and I are down here because we are all um, alumni of the Western Legislative Academy, which is a really great program that's put on by the Council of State Governments. Um, I want to let you know back, at, at Edgar, go ahead and wave. Um, he's back in the lobby. So if anybody is interested in applying for the program, um, I encourage you to go out to talk to Edgar and Martha in the lobby um, because they are at the Capitol for the next couple of days. Come talk to me if you want an additional opportunity to go and meet with them. But I, um, uh, let's see. Um, well, I'm just going to go ahead and read this if that's okay. Um, yeah. So the the CSG West is a great resource for members of the legislature. This includes conducting research and bringing together legislators on issues affecting the West. For those of you who are within your first four years of service, you should consider applying to the Western Legislative Academy, which is hosted annually in Colorado Springs. Tomorrow they are hosting a breakfast for alumni of the Western Legislative Academy from 8 to 9 a.m. in 603 over in the SSB building. Um, but, you know, if you're interested in going, please consider going and visiting with them as well. Um, there are currently 15 alumni from our legislature who are still serving. Um, finally, this year's CSG West annual meeting will be convening July 19th through the 22nd in Boise, Idaho, which will be the 75th anniversary of uh, the Western Regional Office. Do you guys like to say anything? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> whoever is answering from above. Um, this is a really great nonpartisan um, kind of a school for legislators. And it talks about um, working in the West and working with each other. And I uh, highly recommend it that you um, go to this. You'll make some uh, really interesting contacts and uh, really great information. Yeah, and I just uh, graduated from the program uh, last year. And uh, it's a really great way to meet legislators from around the West region and to uh, find out what things are going on over there and, and really share a lot of ideas. It's a really great program. I encourage you all to sign up if, if you want to go do it. Representative Hooter. <laughs> Thank you. And I would just like to add that Minority Leader McKean and I did the Western Legislative Conference together. And um, there was so much value in that program. There was uh, some really fun um, and completely out-of-the-box personal development training, which we all think were um, uh, don't need any more, but you would be quite surprised in what we learned about being more effective communicators. It was really a great experience to work with and collaborate with legislators who come from the Rocky Mountain region and from the western states. It's very different than when you go back east and you're dealing with the eastern states and the midwestern states. We have our unique issues and um, we have a lot in common and to get to know legislators from these states regardless of party affiliation are relationships that you build on uh, for years after you've participated in the academy. So if you have any interest, um, our leadership uh, funds this program on your behalf, so I encourage you to apply. You won't regret it. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, <clears throat> there's been a crime committed in this house. Uh -oh. I opened my drawer to get a pen out this morning, and someone, and I'm assuming it's the minority leader, decided I needed New Mexican chili seeds in my drawer. And these are not acceptable in the house. Only Pueblo chili seeds are acceptable. So, Mr. Speaker, I just, I want to know what you're going to do about this. And from the looks of his guilty face, I'm pretty sure it was the minority leader. Minority Leader McKean. Um, Mr. Speaker, I feel like that is, seeds are seeds. I love all seeds. These are chili seeds. It does not matter where they're from. It does not matter who they belong to. It matters that they are now yours. If, they're, if they grow in Pueblo, are they not Pueblo chilies? You took an oath to the Colorado Constitution. 
Constitution, <laughs> sir. Colorado. Thank you. Um, you know, um, going through people's desks <laughs> is a finable offense. Um, breaking and entering. Breaking and entering of the desk. <laughs> think of the long. Think of how many people have sat. I sat in that desk for a long time. Um, uh, for the majority leader and on behalf of Pueblo and the license plate and all that other stuff, uh, there will be a three dollar and fifty cent fine <laughs> issued to the. You can buy yourself some chili seeds. <laughs> per percent of Herod. <laughs> trying to call balls and strikes up here, you know. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, members, we had an appropriations hearing this morning, which means we have a joke of the day. And I will note that um, some folks on one side of the aisle have not been showing up for the joke competition. And I'm very disappointed. So I have nominated Representative Lynch to come on down and tell his joke that he forgot to share with the Appropriations Committee. But I'm also going to have to tip my hat to the in-committee winner, Representative McCormick. Come on. Why were you ready? Why were you ready? <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> you got to be ready. Sometimes you just know. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I couldn't make it this morning. In the parking lot, there was a young child that had, uh, that had came across some toys left there. It was six little plastic horses that this kid had uh, ingested, and uh, I would just like for you to know that his uh, condition is stable. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Representative McCormick. All right. Two robbers were robbing a liquor store when one robber grabs a bottle and asks the other robber, is this whiskey? The other says, yeah, but not as whiskey as robbing a bank. <laughs> That's why we're politicians down here at the Capitol. Representative Weissman. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. I can sense the frustration up there at that horrible pun. I have a more mundane announcement, and that is about today's judiciary calendar. Uh, judiciary Committee, we have three bills today. We are hearing House Bill 1119, Senate Bill 86, and Senate Bill 23. We are in the large room, a.k.a. the Old State Library, across the way, 1.30 p.m. See you there. Representative Exum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Transportation and Local Government, we have one bill this afternoon, Senate Bill uh, 108 with uh, Representative Valdez D. 130. Representative Lantine. Good morning, members of the Health and Insurance Committee. I originally thought today was Wednesday, and I was going to say we had a meeting today this afternoon, but I just remembered it's Tuesday, and we don't have a hearing today, so yay. No Health and Insurance Committee meeting today. I have one announcement. Representative McLaughlin will represent or will replace Representative Cutter and Representative Tone will replace Representative Michael Sanjina on public and behavioral health and human services for today only. Representative Herod. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I just want to make a quick announcement. We do have a guest on the floor today. Um, for those of you all who are fans of MSU and those of you guys who are getting to know MSU, uh, we actually have a student group that will be participating today in some of the hearings. Um, it's called Black X Era, which is a black student organization uh, supporting black students, faculty, and staff. We also have Antoine Johnson here. He is the founder and president of Black X Era uh, and will be participating in our hearings today. Would you please stand and be acknowledged by the chamber? Thank you so much for coming. Thanks so much. Welcome to the chamber. Majority Leader Eskar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to lay over third reading um, until tomorrow, March 16th. 
Seeing no objection, the third reading of Bill's calendar will be laid over one day until Wednesday, March 16th. That brings us, oh, let's, um, uh, let's, do, committee, uh, let's do reports of committees of reference. Mr. Schiebel. Committee on Appropriations, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1003 as amended, 1055, 1068, 1247, Senate Bill 34 be referred to, the, referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Committee on Finance, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1213, 1241, 1242 as amended, be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on State, Civic, Military, and Veteran Affairs, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1021, 1125, 1204 be postponed indefinitely. While we're at it, printing report. The chief clerk reports printing report bills. will be printed in the journal. All right. That brings us to general order second reading of bills. Representative Froelich. See no objection. You have heard the motion. See no objection. Representative Froelich will take the chair. The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there is a request for reading a bill at length. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon motion of the majority leader. The coat rule is relaxed. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of bill, Senate Bill 22092. Senate Bill 92 by Senator Gardner, also Representative Soper, concerning changes to the Colorado Probate Act. Code, probate code, excuse me. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you, Representative. Well, members, this, oh, I move uh, Senate Bill uh, 92, and there's no committee report. To the committee report. I don't see a committee report. Oh. You're just straight to the bill. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. So members, I know this is the one bill that you've been dying to hear all year, the updates to the probate code. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm glad someone was listening in the chamber. <laughs> so the changes, yeah, the changes here are uh, somewhat uh, nuanced, uh, such as, um, changing it to per capita at each generation rather than by representation. By representation was a term used in New York law, so it's good to be consistent with other areas of Colorado law. And then we're updating the code to make sure there's gender neutral language. The last change that's included here is the ability to inherit if you have more than two parents. That'd be a situation where one of your parents dies, your other parent remarries, the step parent adopts you, and then that'd be the ability for you to inherit from more than two parents. These are good changes, and I would ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Uh, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 92. Oh, uh, and Representative Herod. I'm just wondering how we let a Soper bill out of Judiciary Committee with no one else on the bill. I feel like this is sneaky. I need to hear from the Judiciary Committee Chair, Representative Weissman. Did you sign off on this? Are we good on this? No, I'm not signing off. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Definitely not signing off. 
So we're back to passage of Senate Bill 92. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those against say nay. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 92 is adopted. Passed. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1095. <clears throat> House Bill 1095 by Representatives Lontine and Will, also Senators Winter and Simpson, concerning an expansion of a physician's assistant ability to practice and in connection therewith, changing the relationship between a physician's assistant and a physician or podiatrist from supervision to collaboration for physician's assistants with less experience who are working in a new specialty, establishing the collaboration requirements and requiring physician assistants with more experience to consult with the physician's assistant's healthcare team. Representative Lontine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so here we are on House Bill 1095 redo. Um, I just want to um, tell you that we are here to run an amendment. We heard um, from several members that they needed some clarity on the issue of scope of practice. Um, we listened to those members. We came back with an amendment and here we are with L0, I move L009, I'm sorry. I've been reminded I haven't moved the bill. I move House Bill 1095. Okay. And now I move L009, I believe, is the amendment number. Um, this amendment was put on everyone's desk on Friday well. in a goldenrod. So I hope that everyone had had time to look at it. Um, but basically, this um, um, defines the scope of practice for physician's assistants. And I ask for an aye vote on the amendment. The amendment has been properly displayed. Yeah, we'll see uh, do you wish to say anything more about the amendment, representatives? OK, then we'll call on Representative Doherty. A division has been requested. We have. I'll just wait. You can debate prior to the division, so let's call back on Representative Doherty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, while I appreciate the sponsors working on an amendment to this bill, unfortunately, um, we don't believe that addresses any of the concerns that we had on seconds a few weeks ago when we debated this issue. Um, and I'm going to lay out a few reasons why I don't think the amendment addresses the concerns. Um, the amendment, if you read it, only describes what PAs may do, but not what they cannot do or when they must consult with a physician, which I think was the basis of the debate of most of the debate uh, last time. By omitting any discussion of phys physician supervision or collaboration under any circumstance or for PAs with no experience, the amendment allows PAs to practice independently. By omitting supervision, it removes the team-based collaborative safety net that PAs and their patients need. The amendment does not address the core and legitimate concerns the House of Medicine has repeatedly raised about allowing PAs to practice independently and does not support the collaborative team-based model of care that is universally accepted as the best way to serve patients. The bill, even with the amendment, would still allow PAs to practice independently. It includes no supervision or required collaboration, which is the definition of independent practice. Um, thank you, and um, again, I, I have strong opposition to the amendment just because I don't believe that it adds anything or addresses any of the concerns we previously mentioned. Thank you. Representative Malika, and we are on Amendment L009. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to, uh, to the sponsors of the bill. I, I know they've worked. I, uh, I do rise in opposition to the amendment, though, because uh, the amendment does not uh, address the underlying issue, which is uh, independent practice. And uh, we had a robust debate on seconds uh, and, and really talking about safety and that, uh, you know, safety should not be sacrificed. And uh, this amendment doesn't address that. Uh, while I appreciate the work, it just, it just doesn't get there. And so uh, I would rise in opposition and ask for a no vote, please. Further discussion on Representative Lantine. 
So um, the bill itself does not create independent practice. Um, we discussed this at length on second reading. There is obviously disagreement about that position. Um, but um, there was a request to define exactly what the scope of practice was so that um, there would be no um, concern over PAs um, working beyond their scope. And so I ask for a yes vote on the amendment just so we're clear on what it does. So thank you for your vote. Further discussion on amendment L009? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of amendment L009 and a division has been called. All those in favor, uh, uh, all those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of amendment L009 to House Bill 1095, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken. Uh, I'm going to take a brief recess. Sorry about that. The committee will come back to order. Back to our division on amendment L009 to House Bill 1095. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of amendment L009, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken. Thank you, you may be seated. All those opposed, please stand and remain standing in one place until the count is taken. Got the, did you get? Thank you, you may be seated. Amendment L009 is passed. To the bill, Representative Herod. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I did stand uh, for the amendment, um, but I am opposed to the bill. Um, I just wanted to 
say that I have had lengthy conversations um, with folks, especially one um, very vocal advocate PA who I thank her uh, for taking the time to walk me through this bill and walk me through exactly um, how she envisions this bill to go into place. But unfortunately, I don't think that there are enough safeguards to ensure that some of the unintended consequences don't happen. Um, as folks know, my brother, cousin, mother, brother are all in the medical profession. Um, my, my cousin, who's a cardiologist right here in Aurora, um, had a, a long conversation about um, PAs in general. and. Uh, while we don't oppose physician assistants, period, I mean, obviously they're a part of the team, um, the challenge with them is the rising cost because traditionally he will get far more referrals from PAs um, than he does from doctors to cardiology. Um, and that will increase cost for everyone and decrease access, and I'm very concerned about that. So while I understand the intent of this bill, um, I do believe we need a more surgical approach uh, than what we have here today. So I just thank all my colleagues for the robust discussion that we've had in the past, and I will be a no vote. Representative Chitone. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I come down here today because I didn't get to speak on this bill uh, last time it was on second reading uh, because I was up on the board. And I just wanted to say a few things because I heard this bill in committee not only this year, but the previous year as well. and. The first time we heard this bill, uh, we got an email from some of the doctors saying that doctors were pilots and flight attend and the PAs are flight attendants. That's what they think about PAs. Let that, let that sink in. What kind of comparison is that? It's, it's such an unfair comparison. And I let them have it in committee and I said, how dare you say that? How dare you say that a PA is like a flight attendant to your pilot? That's ridiculous. That's not fair at all. And you know, this time in committee, they didn't make that comparison because they knew I was going to take them to task on that again. But they still talk down on PAs. And I've heard again and again and again here and in committee that this is going to make unsafe care and not the quality care is not going to be there for patients what is that is that I mean that, that's basically saying that a PA is a flight attendant and doesn't know what they're doing and a flight attendant can't fly a plane that's not true at all my brother happens to be a PA Representative Lantin brought that up last time and he teaches doctors and PAs and nurses and other healthcare professionals how to do his work. He's a PA and he teaches doctors how to do stuff. So to diminish what a PA does and the talents that a PA has and the abilities that a PA has is so unfair and it's really disrespectful to that occupation. This is about collaboration. This is about getting more people to have access to care from people who are passionate about their work, who are knowledgeable about their work, and may in some cases even know more than a doctor. So I'm in favor of this bill. I think you should vote yes on this bill. This is, this is going to be good for this profession uh, to really get more patients and get that collaboration going with the team, because that's what this is about. Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I have not been a primary participant in, in this debate, but also just want to take a second and say calling somebody a flight attendant is not an insult per se. The people who've been working as flight attendants during COVID have undergone incredible, incredible burdens and had to take incredible risks during that time. So I'm not, I'm not here to judge anybody or say anything about that, but I don't I also don't want flight attendants to become secondhand citizens in our, uh, uh, you know, in our economy and where we are um, based on this debate. So I look forward to this debate, don't really, but I look forward to this debate, but I also don't want on this floor flight attendant to be something that's a derisive term because they have been on 
the front lines um, in the, over the last couple of years, and I think we should treat them with respect, especially for anyone who has traveled um, during uh, the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Larson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it is an honor to serve with you. It's cold. Oh, good. That's all right. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, members. And first, I do want to thank you. Wonderful. Thank, uh, thank you. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's all good. It's been a long weekend. Uh, so, members, uh, I do want to thank the sponsors of the bill for working in good faith on an amendment uh, to, I think, try to address some of the concerns. I still, however, rise opposed to the bill uh, for many of the same reasons that I spoke about the first time. Uh, and I just want to run down a couple of those things because it has been a little while. But first off, I think there is, I think the, the problem that we're trying to address with this bill around rural access is, while it is a real one, again, I underscore, I do not think that this is actually going to cause a flood of of PAs and people wanting to move into the rural areas to provide care. This is a, a complicated issue that has existed for a long time, but again, I would encourage you to speak to anyone in the medical profession um, and ask them why they choose not to practice in a rural setting. And frankly, it has to do more with unfamiliarity with the culture. People who don't come from rural towns tend not to want to move there for work. There are things I think that we could do, and I hope that we have some legislation to that effect that might incentivize people from those communities to enter the profession of medicine uh, and may incentivize people to go out there, but I do not think that merely allowing uh, PAs a broader scope of practice is going to suddenly get them to move to rural communities. So while I appreciate that that's a very real concern, I just think that this may be giving, holding out a false hope there. The other thing, while the amendment, I think, moved the bill in the right direction, it still it, it def did a good job of defining what a PA can do, but it didn't do a good job of defining what they can't. And I do think, again, we need to look at PAs, as we've heard from the two folks that are directly involved in the medical community who also serve in this chamber, the PAs are an integral part of the medicine team. And I have not met a doctor who practices with a PA who doesn't love and appreciate what their PA does and who doesn't hold them up as a valued member of the team. But similarly, they don't want that PA to do what the doctor does because it's a fundamentally different level of training as the system was designed to be. There's a reason that doctors have to undergo almost 10 times as much clinical trial or clinical hours as a PA does. There's a reason that their schooling is significantly longer because they are supposed to be the, the folks that know, that have the broad picture, that understand, hey, this lab came back and it looks like this pretty typical uh, result, but the doctor's the one that's supposed to look at that and say, oh, it may be this more obscure, more rare condition, and these indicators might indicate that. That's how the system's supposed to work, and I think we've heard from, from the medical community that it's working fairly well. Uh, and I worry with this bill, even with the amendment, that the scope of what a PA is going to be able to do is not defined in this. And it does open the door to a more independent type of practice, which again, I think is a conversation that's worth having. But if we're gonna have that conversation, I think we need to talk about the level of training required for PAs, the level of clinical hours required for PAs and not just say, hey, you know, we're gonna take this current system and allow a person who has been functioning in this specific defined role and suddenly broaden it uh, you know, in an ambiguous way into what a doctor does. So members, I still rise in opposition to this bill. I again implore you to look to the two people in this chamber who practice every day in the med medical community, look to where they are on this bill because I think they have the most um, you know, on the, on the ground experience here, and I think that their opinion on this uh, should hold a lot of weight in this chamber. So I respectfully ask for a no vote. Thank you. Representative McCluskey. Oh. Thank you. 
Okay, a division has been called on the bill, but we'll still debate the bill. So thank you. Um, and uh, Representative McCluskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to start where I left off when I came to speak in favor of House Bill 1095 a week or so ago. And again, offer that I hear the voices of the medical professionals here in this body, as well, of, as well as those outside of the chamber. I have great respect for the myriad of people and opinions that have been coming our way to provide input and thoughtful um, guidance on how we should proceed with our vote, with our support of this effort. I fall back on and listen to the voices from my district. Most notably, as I shared with you last week, from my federally qualified health centers, those community care clinics in Summit County, in the Roaring Fork Valley, that are providing health care services for those who are uninsured, for those covered by Medicaid, um, for many who have very limited access to health care services. And what I heard was that while this bill may not draw a significant number of new PAs to rural Colorado, the physician's assistance that we currently have in place in our communities are a tremendous asset and are doing great work. This bill allows us to expand their ability to work with more patients. It creates greater capacity in these organizations that are really the last hope for many people in securing high quality health care. From a, a, a member of the Grand River Hospital and Medical Center in Rifle, I received a letter that talked about this concern on independent practice. And while this bill has no language for independent practice, nor is it the intent of this bill, you know, PAs will remain partners in collaborating with physicians. Many PAs work in rural and frontier practices, but just can't function fully to the extent of their training, their education, and particularly in rural Colorado, their experience. I heard one story of a PA who had more than 20 years of experience and really did have the skills and the ability to provide services in a way that would have been um, of the highest standard for any of us in another facility. As I said the other day, there is no quick fix for the challenges we face in rural Colorado on the topic of health care. But this bill does make a difference for those of us who are living in rural communities in this state. And I am hopeful that you will support this effort as um, 1095 comes before you today. Thank you. Representative Chipper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just wanted to speak to uh, a couple things that I've heard about the scope of practice and how it says what they can do but not what they cannot do. We as a legislative body, when we expressly say what someone can do, we are then also saying what they cannot do. So when we articulate this is what you can do, what we leave out then is understood to be what they cannot do. The reason for that is it would be an infinitesimal list if we started listing out all the things they cannot do. So rest assured, if we define the scope of practice as what this is what they can do, the inverse is also true. Anything outside of that is what they cannot do. So understand that first and foremost. Second. For me, I think ultimately where I'm going to land on this bill is I'm going to support it with the amendment. And here's the reason why. I think the question is, do, are we okay with a limited scope after some years of practice under the supervision of a physician having a PA practice outside of the supervision of a physician? I think there's some circumstances where that's appropriate. 
some circumstances where it's not. I'm not going to be the judge of that. I feel like the insurance market's going to weigh in and determine whether or not they're going to insure someone in a particular community given what that person is doing. And that, to me, is a safe enough balance. But to, take a, to me, this provides an opportunity and provides communities the opportunity to make a decision whether or not they would have a PA practice after having completed the supervision under the physician, wh whether they would allow a PA to practice without supervision. Um, when I think about my medical care, uh, when I think about my daughter's medical care, with the exception of the fertility specialist, I saw the physician every time, almost every time that I went. I have actually never met my daughter's uh, pediatrician. Actually, Yadira has met my daughter more times. Um, I have only met the nurse practitioner and uh, the PA. And we're in the metro area. For myself, my primary care has been my PA. So um, I think that's the question. If people trust that a PA can operate with a limited scope, absent the supervision of physician, I think this is a good thing for Colorado. If they don't, and I can understand that, then vote no. Representative Pico. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did support the amendment, but I don't support the bill. Um, and I'm going to come in there with a little bit of perspective here. I heard an interesting comparison there with the flight attendants. Now, I've flown. I'm, I'm a pilot. But I've also flown as an air crew position. My son, I've got one son who's a doctor, and another son is a hospital corpsman. So I've got a little bit of perspective on both sides of this issue. And it is not whether or not a flight attendant or a non-pilot air crew can fly a plane or whether a physician assistant can do the work of a doctor. Um, it's an issue of division responsibilities. And that's where I'm coming down on this. Uh, I've had a long talk on what those relationships are between a physician assistant and a doctor. Um, and it just, I'm not satisfied that this bill adequately addresses it. I appreciate the issues of trying to get greater medical care to rural situations. I've been out at sea where the only medical personnel was a hospital corpsman, not a doctor. Appreciate that that's necessarily what some people have to do sometimes, but I don't think it's something we need to be writing in the law at this time. Um, while I appreciate the bill, I appreciate the intent, um, I'm not there. I don't think this is quite, quite covers it. So I, I recommend a no vote. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we talk about rural Colorado. Well, I get to represent Lake City, um, which is in Hinsdale County. It's the only city in Hinsdale County. It is the most remote place in the lower 48, um, remote, remote county in the lower 48. And a representative Catlin gets them next year because I unfortunately will be losing this county. They have um, about 800 people there. Sometimes it goes up to a couple thousand in the summer. But they have about 800 people. And um, they have a PA there now. They have been advertising for years for a doctor to come. They have a really good medical center there. Um, but no doctors were showing up. So they have a PA who came in and is working uh, with people. He knows exactly how far he can go with his skills. He's not trying to do surgery. He's not being a doctor of any other kind. But boy, does that community love him. Um, he is working with a team of experienced um, couple of other PAs and nurses, and they are taking care of all 800 people in Lake City, Colorado. It's, um, it's a pretty remarkable um, marriage that they have there. So I strongly support this bill because uh, our rural communities need that health care. If you ever go to Lake City, um, it takes a while to get there and it takes a while to get out of there. They don't have the pleasure of driving to the doctor's office at lunchtime. It takes a long time to get from A to B. And um, having somebody in town who cares about them and who cares about the community is very, very important. So strongly suggest a yes vote. Thanks. Thank you. Representative Carveo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, I, I don't want to debate this um, uh, or make my comments very long. I think this has been well debated. Um, I just wanted to make it clear um, that as the only doctor um, in the assembly that um, even with the um, amendment, I do not believe um, that um, I can support this bill. Um, this, um, while we disagree on whether it may create indep independent practice or not for PAs, in my opinion, does. Um, and, um, and the amendment um, does not do anything um, to, to fix that. Um, it is not tied, um, in, in the end, um, their practice is no longer tied to a physician, which is what they trained to do. And so I continue to urge a no vote. Thank you. Representative Weissman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, I haven't spoken on this before. I was not on the committee that heard it. Uh, but given the magnitude of the debate that we're now having, you know, I, I thought I would come down and say where I think I'm going to land on this bill and, and why. And lest I bury the lead, uh, I am going to be supporting 1095, particularly with the amendment. I supported the amendment on the vote just now. You know, I read this when it came over, uh, like I try to read everything around here. I looked at the committee report. I saw some serious concessions made by the sponsors in committee in reaction to what I think were issues raised in committee and an attempt to negotiate toward achieving their policy in good faith. I also see on page nine of the bill uh, some pretty important language allowing for consultation and referral details to be further determined at a very localized level, employer, group, hospital, facility, physician. So what I read the bill to say is that there is room to tailor these things in all the different corners of our state that we've been talking about, and I think that's important. You know, like I think everybody here, I've gotten rather a lot of email from both sides, very impassioned email, some of them quite long and obviously written by hand and, and not of a form nature. You know, I think that's because Physicians have put thousands of hours and years of their lives into their trainings, and they really want to practice their profession to help people. And I think physician assistants have also put thousands of hours and years of their lives into acquiring their training, and they really want to help people. They've just chosen two slightly different paths that, as we have heard, walk together. You know, I think that we have to hear all of that, um, you know, I, I particularly want to acknowledge, um, you know, we do have two medical professionals in our midst here, and what they have been going through, even as they've also been serving here and going on year three of the pandemic, really kind of boggles the mind, and they have my, my greatest respect. But at the end of the day, what I think it is to be in a representative capacity, as we all are, is to hear everything that comes into us from all sides. And then if there is a close call, to supply our own judgment, to break that tie. I think that is the essence of representative government. My judgment ultimately is that I'm not going to come down on the side of physicians or physician assistants. I'm trying to come down on the side of what I believe is right for my community. I believe that my community, as with a lot of communities in the state, struggles with access to health care. I believe that this bill, particularly with the sideboards that are in it, that were heightened in committee, that were further heightened by the amendment we just adopted up here several minutes ago, provide adequate protections. You know, my grandfather, who came to this country when he was six years old, uh, speaking no English, ultimately became a doctor. That was his way of expressing his thanks to what became his home country and paying it for it. And, and, taking care of people in, in a country that had taken care of him and his family. He had a practice of the sort that probably doesn't exist very much anymore. It was attached, his, his medical office was attached to the home where he raised my parents. He would sometimes take payment in kind in sacks of food from immigrant families as his was, where they couldn't pay in the coin of the realm. Late in his life, my grandfather begged my brother and me to go into the medical professions in some way, you know, maybe not even being a doctor, maybe doing medical research, scientific research. It was maybe the most earnest thing that, that he had ever begged of, of us to carry on something that was so important to him. Was not my path, was not my brother's path, obviously this is my path here, but 
I guess I've been thinking about that a little bit because although it was not my road to help people get better and, and, and heal what illed them through direct practice of medical arts, once in a while in this place it can be by voting to change the laws in a way that I think will make access to care a little bit more available, particularly in communities of our state where uh, it, is, it is not available enough now. We have entire zip codes where there are no doctors at all in this state. You ever download the database from Dora and throw it into a GIS, you can see that for yourself. I've done that. I think the point that Rep McCluskey made has some force. How many PAs are we going to bring to rural areas? Who knows? But I think it matters more to allow those who are already there to practice a little bit more fully. So for all of those reasons, uh, I will be supporting 1095, particularly as amended. I encourage everybody to think about doing the same. And I appreciate both sponsors for working so hard on this. Thank you. Representative Hooten. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so members, um, apparently a lot of us here have someone we're related to who is a physician. Um, you he heard me speak last Friday night, and I'll just say it again. My father was a rural physician, an internist. Uh, and we're not talking about PAs operating outside of their current scope, scope of practice. That's not why we're talking about. We're not talking about them stepping in to do surgery. We're not talking about them stepping in to do anesthesiology. We're not talking about them stepping in to take over uh, a role that um, is or, or uh, a piece of practice or education that a specialist is trained to do, and they are not. We're talking primarily about primary care physicians and internists. My father was a country doctor, and he worked seven days a week, and he was on call the entire time because in our community, we did not have enough physicians for the needs that were there. And so in the 70s, when PAs became their own profession, he hired two of them in his practice, which gave him, it, he was able to care for more patients because there are so many things that they were able to do without his direct supervision. It expanded the practice that he had. and. Um, he was incredibly grateful for them. Rural Colorado faces the same uh, situation. They do not have enough primary care physicians. I went on a tour of rural clinics when I was a member of public health committee six years, uh, five and six years ago, and it was very eye-opening. And for those who didn't see it, I would like to refer you back to a letter from a former uh, state senator, Irene Aguilera, who wrote to us, and she was an MD and also a teacher and a professor, and she wrote to us and she encouraged us to support this bill. So I'm a strong supporter, and I encourage you, if you think you uh, uh, are um, going to vote no, I encourage you to reconsider that. Thank you. Representative Aguilar Benavidez. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members, I think this is an important bill that the sponsors have brought. Um, but from the discussion we had the first time on second reading, <laughs> and this, and from what I heard occurred in uh, committee, this is a bill that we don't, um, we're getting different perspectives on. And I read the letter from Dr. Aguilar. And, um, but I also listened to uh, Dr. Caraveo and Nurse um, Mullica on this as well. And all of the different emails that we've gotten from doctors and, and nurse practitioners and PAs 
going back and forth, which shows even in the professions there's not unanimity. And I agree, it doesn't actually change the scope of practice of what they can do. It does change, I think, the biggest thing is how they practice with regard to how much training they need or don't need and how far supervision compared to collaboration means and I don't feel at all comfortable in making that decision when I'm hearing from the profession two sides of that and, and not being able to do that. The other part is um, some have said that this is really to increase um, health coverage in the rural areas. And there isn't unanimity on that either. There are the a large number of PAs in the rural areas now, but there's nothing that I can see in this bill that incentivizes PAs to go to the rural areas, which I think is important, um, and I don't see it. And I know there's a bill coming that will incentivize not only PAs, but doctors. And doctors is where they really have a need, at least I think, in the rural areas. So um, I was very moved, I think it was Representative Soper's um, comments that doing this also might indicate that we are endorsing um, that for rural families having PAs be their sole um, way, not their sole, but their primary way to re obtain medical service, that endorsing that might not be the best thing for us to do because it does create that double standard between um, the more urban areas and the rural areas. So with that in mind, I, I'm going to be a no vote. I do appreciate all the work gone into this, but I don't think from experts in this area there's agreement on moving forward in the amount of supervision or the amount um, of need for medical treatment in the rural areas. Thank you. Representative Pelton. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I know I've mentioned many times down here at the well that I was a county commissioner prior to becoming a House representative. We had a county-owned hospital in Cheyenne County at that time, a frontier county, 1,800 people, 1,800 square miles. We were constantly, and that hospital is still constantly looking for uh, medical docs. We have one right now that can supervise the PAs, but the PAs out in Cheyenne County anyway, and I would presume across all of rural Colorado, give top-notch care. They, they have the same standard as the doctors do, and uh, it's just hard to attract doctors out there to communities of 800. There's another hospital in Eads, Colorado, a community of 500. It, it's hard to get people out there. We just don't have the amenities that they're used to in the city. But phys physician's assistants are more attracted to come out there, and they do deliver a, a very good level of care. And so I'm in full support of this bill. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do want to point out a few things that have been brought to my attention that should make you be in favor of this bill. If I could just highlight a couple things. The level of professionalism across the medical space from the certified nurse's assistant to the registered nurse to the physician's assistant to the family nurse practitioner to the medical doctor to the senior medical doctor, to the chief medical doctor, those relationships and the level of professionalism are incredibly high. People are questioning whether that level of professionalism would change under this bill. Representative Catone came down here and pointed out that the level of professionalism or the level of care will not change. PAs will always call a doctor when they need that consultation. But what this does for rural Colorado, ladies and gentlemen, it helps solve 
the problems we have at the farthest edges of even my district in those frontier regions that don't have any quality of care because they have no care. I also want to point something else out. Everyone's concerned about the quality of care in rural Colorado. Well, let me tell you something. We have a comprehensive and robust system out there that does account for this, and I'm going to explain what that is. We have our clinics. We have our regional and rural hospitals. We also have out there a Flight for Life network that is pretty darn comprehensive that gets patients within that golden hour to our large medical hospitals. And there is always consultation, there is conversations, the quality of care and the telehealth that we have today. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise you this will not jeopardize the quality of care. That argument does not hold water. In fact, it will do nothing more than help our quality of care in rural Colorado. I am very proud of the bill sponsors to bring this forth, and I would ask everybody to consider voting yes so we can get the health care that people deserve in rural Colorado. This will not jeopardize that. It was brought up that we have another bill coming up. That other bill will not solve the problems that we have. You can't always solve a problem with money. But this bill brought forth by Representative Lontine and Representative Will is very thoughtful. It considers the farthest edges of rural Colorado in our state, and I am so glad that they have brought this forth. So please consider those things as we move forward. This is a good bill for all of Colorado, and more importantly, the rest of Colorado. Thank you. Minority Leader McKean. Thank you, Madam Chair. Folks, I've, I've heard a lot about kind of where I was wrestling with this, and that is on exactly the topic that you just heard from Rep. Benavidez, the idea of a collaborative model of care. And I used to have a sister-in-law who was a PA, and so I'm very familiar with what PA school is, with how much, how many patient hours they have, but, but truly what what I came away with was this great respect for how PAs fit into the system we have, how the collaborative care model works. To Dr. Caraveo and, and her points about the PAs that she works with, it is extremely important that they have a very close supervisory relationship with their physicians. Here's the reason why. To be able to, to develop the, the kind of instinctual care and, and being able to develop those care models, it takes time with someone who has thousands of patient hours, has all of the things that you need as a practitioner. And so, so I don't support this bill mostly because I think that there needs to be more of that tight collaboration, not less. And I think, in fact, one of the things that, that I would be concerned with, and really, truly back to, to the concerns of rural Colorado, you know, I go talk to, every year we're allowed to, because we didn't get to through COVID, but I talk to the medical students who are going out to rural Colorado. And some of the things that, that we talk about is, what is it going to be like to be in business for yourself? What is it going to be like to be there? Because for the very first time, a lot of those physicians are going to be on their own. And they're going to be on their own with thousands and thousands of patient hours behind them. But they, they need help, and they have help in the model that we have for physician's assistance today. To do this without that model, to have PAs without the kind of supervision we have today, I think would not be good for patient care. I urge a no vote. Further discussion on House Bill 1095. And a division has been called. Representative Lantine. We're still discussing, but just so you know what's coming. Representative Will, Representative Lantine. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, members, for um, your attention to this bill. I think um, we've had a lot of precedences is that a word, shattered with this bill um, in a lot of different ways. Um, and I appreciate the engagement we've seen. There have been several references to a letter left upon our desk last Friday 
by, I don't know if you call a senator or former colleague, but a former member of the legislature who was also uh, a doctor. And so I just, I, I point this out um, because there is, as Representative Benavides point out, not unanimity amongst providers. And I um, would like to read um, that letter um, as my closing remarks, because I think if you didn't read it, it has a lot of um, good information about the subject at hand. <clears throat> Dear Honorable Representative, as a former state senator who focused on access to health care, I am writing to express my strong support for this bill and to ask you for a yes vote on third reading. But as you may know, I practiced primary care internal medicine at Denver Health for 22 years. During my time of practice, I had the opportunity to work with and supervise many physicians assistants and nurse practitioners. The quality of care they provided was excellent. Both physicians assistants and nurse practitioners recognized the limits of their training and would seek consultation when needed. These are highly skilled and trained professionals who are very invested in healthy outcomes for the people of Colorado. Their judgment is exceptional, and I would trust them to provide quality, safe, effective, frontline care for Colorado residents. What you may not know is that I served for eight years on the Colorado Medical Board. During this time, we had very few if any, complaints about quality of care provided by physician's assistants. Many physician's assistants struggled to identify physicians willing to enter into a collaborative agreement with them because of the workload and potential competition of the market. It seemed as if nurse practitioners had an advantage over them because of the Nurse Practice Act. As a legislator, I not infrequently found myself on a different side of an issue from the Colorado Medical Society. My loyalty always was and continues to be to the people of Colorado and not to a specific licensed group. It is my informed opinion that the people of Colorado need access to more high quality primary care providers and that the adoption of House Bill 10, excuse me, 1095 would provide that access. If you do not feel comfortable voting yes, uh, she asked to visit with you all, but I guess we're past that. Um, I appreciate the attention from some of you in the chamber, obviously not all, Members, can I draw your attention to the comments in the well, please, and take your side conversations outside the room, but probably don't do that because we're about to have a division. <laughs> um, yes, don't tell them to leave the room because it'll be like cats, herding cats to get them back. Um, I would appreciate your due consideration and yes vote for House Bill 1095. Representative Will. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It is I, an honor uh, to serve with you. So I think you've heard from my, my rural partners here in this chamber. And we've all received a lot of emails from PAs who work in the rural areas and who currently work in rural areas and want to remain in those rural areas and practice and not lose your job because a supervising physician leaves. I've heard the personal stories about experienced PAs, PAs of 20 plus years of experience who are in jeopardy losing their job should their supervising should their supervising physician leave. This isn't right, and this isn't good for rural Colorado. It isn't good for all of Colorado. Um, PAs provide quality care, and they want to continue to provide that quality care and want to work in rural Colorado. This bill helps them do that. That's why I'm on the bill. I think it helps them do that. And uh, it does not erode the system, and we currently have it, and it enhances and improves our system. It does not create independent practice it takes government out of the equation and allows employers and doctors to determine how their employees should work together. 
And you know, the, in, in rural Colorado, only 13% of these PAs are currently practicing in these areas. And eliminating the requirement for PAs to have a specific relationship instead of the consultation uh, with a physician will make it easier for PAs to practice in rural and medically underserved communities. I, I, like, the dere I like the deregulation in this bill, and I think it will really, really help. You know, we talk, uh, have nothing but respect for uh, my colleagues here in this chamber, and many of them talk that are in the medical profession. Uh, we also heard from rural legislators like, uh, like Lake City there, 800 people. We heard from Representative Pelton, you know, and those small communities of Eads and Shine Wells and those. We, we need this. And I can't stress it enough, if you haven't lived in those communities and experienced it, uh, you, I don't think you understand. But in the, in the, when we talk about quality of care, if I'm out in uh, Lake City, as my colleague Rep McLaughlin talked about, or if I'm out in Eads, Colorado, or Shine Wells, and, and uh, <clears throat> a horse rolls over on me, horse steps in a badger hole, rolls over on me. I'm speaking a little bit from experience because that happened to me. And um, you're laying out there and can't move. And they finally get you, they don't get an ambulance, they get you in an old station wagon and get you to town. Uh, you're, you're in a lot of pain. You have a broken pelvis, those type of things. When, you, when you're in that situation, you don't care if you're seeing a PA or a physician. You just want some kind of medical health care. And, and that's what we're talking about in this bill. And I, I strongly, you, you heard from the rural legislators in this chamber, and um, they know what they're talking about, they've experienced it, they've lived it. So I strongly ask for an I vote on this bill. Thank you. The question is the adoption of House Bill 1095 as amended. A division has been requested. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of House Bill 1095 as adopted, as amended, sorry, <laughs> please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken. If you're participating remotely, please take your, uh, your put yourself on camera in order to participate. Thank you, you may be seated. All those opposed, please stand and remain. All those opposed, please stand and remain. Sorry, you may be seated, the people who were for. Now we're, I think my mic was off, thank you. Um, all those opposed, please stand and remain standing in one place until the vote, until the count is taken. Did 
confused. Can you ask those online too? Those online? You may be seated. House Bill 1095 is lost. To the bill. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Schiebel, will you? Oh, oh no, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to lay over Senate Bill 95 until the end of second reading calendar. Thank you, so moved. That is a proper motion, I believe. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill, uh, Senate Bill 20. Senate Bill 20 by Senator Gardner, also Representative Tipper, concerning the addition of court reports to the list of professionals who may administer oaths. Representative Tipper. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. The uh, bill actually does what the title says it does. Um, it adds court reporters to the types of individuals that can uh, administer oaths and affirmations. And the reason that this really came to a head is that currently in Colorado, court reporters can't do this unless they're also notaries because notaries themselves have the authority to administer oaths and affirmations. And during the last two years with COVID, we saw a lot of uh, judicial type proceedings go remote. So for example, depositions. And depositions are sworn uh, testimonies that are taken. And because not all court reporters who are the stenographers um, are notaries, they would actually have to pause the remote proceedings and then go into a third proceeding where a notary, remote notary, would come uh, in and minister the oath. And then they'd close that proceeding and go back to the deposition. So it's really a judicial efficiency issue. Um, court Rep. Reporters, yes? As an efficiency issue, will oh, you move, move the, the bill? bill? Yes, I move Senate Bill 20. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, yeah, I get to go over. That's great. Um, and so Senate Bill 20 uh, really, uh, again, it's an efficiency issue and just allows court reporters to administer oaths and affirmations. They have training. They're um, indispensable to our practice as lawyers. Uh, and with that, I ask for a yes vote. Minority Leader McKean. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So there's a, a little letter that hangs on the wall of my office. I'm one of three Coast Guard officials in the history of the United States Coast Guard that can swear oaths. And actually, this is a big deal. And I appreciate you bringing this bill because it's actually a really big deal to create an efficiency in the one place where we know time is of the essence. Right now, our court dockets are full. Um, I became a Coast Guard official, um, a designated Coast Guard official, so that I could swear oaths here in Colorado for promotions and academy appointments and, and also enlistments. And part of that reason was because we didn't have enough folks to do that, and exactly to that point. So thank you for bringing the bill. I urge an I vote. Any further discussion on Senate Bill 20? But seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 20. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1224. House Bill 1224 by Representatives Tipper and Soper, also Senator Gonzalez, concerning theft of public benefits. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, the Judiciary Committee report. And the bill. Uh, and the bill. Which is 12. Which is, uh, 12. Uh, to, the, to the Judiciary report. Representative Tipper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so speaking to the Judiciary Report on House Bill 1224, um, in committee, uh, what we did, um, this bill has been a product of a lot of stakeholding. Uh, we worked with the um, CCJJ, the Colorado Criminal and Juvenile Justice Task Force on this bill. and. In judiciary, we basically took out all portions of the bill that were added in through the CCJJ bill. 
um, which leaves before us today a very narrow bill dealing with specific intent. And with that, I ask for a yes vote on the Judiciary Committee report. The question before us is the adoption of the Judiciary report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay, no. The ayes have it. The Judiciary report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Sopair. Merci. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what we did in a Judiciary Committee is we took it down to only the specific intent element, which is going to be page uh, two of your bill. So it's basically now down to a very, very small bill, only looking at the mens rea element uh, or the mental state for committing the crime. We wanted to make sure that those Coloradans who are engaged in public benefits theft uh, do so with the intentional misrepresentation of uh, withholding material facts and doing so for the purpose of gaining a public benefit. And that is the uh, bill. Representative Chipper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Judiciary really did the heavy work on this. We came out of committee 10-0. Uh, we must have had an absent. Um, with that, I ask for a yes vote on House Bill 1224 as amended. The question before us is House Bill 1224. All those in favor say aye. 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 Well, All those opposed, no. Oh, yeah. House Bill 1224 is adopted. Yeah, yeah, it's over time. Mr. Schiebel, please read the Can title of House Bill 115. Oh, uh, Senate know. Bill 115. Senate Bill 115 by Senators Hawkins, Lewis, and Gardner, also Representative Sober and Tibber, concerning clarifying certain terms as the terms relate to a landowner's liability. Representative Soper, uh, Tipper. Merci. <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 115 and the com uh, House Judiciary Committee report. To the committee report. Thank you, Madam Chair. In uh, So just at a high level, what this bill does is it clarifies what we believe was the legislative intent when the legislature passed the Colorado Premises Liability Act. And the Colorado Premises Liability Act, what is does is it sort of strikes a balance between protecting um, uh, land owner rights, um, incentivizing uh, entrepreneurship, um, and then also giving individuals access to uh, insurance coverage. And a recent bill came down, and my co-prime can ex uh, explain this a bit more, where the Colorado Supreme Court rendered a decision that we believe was contrary to the intent of the legislature. So uh, while he'll talk about the substance of the bill, what happened in committee is that we changed the language to not say that the court got it wrong, essentially, but to say that the court misunderstood uh, the uh, General Assembly's intent. So we just wordsmithed a little bit, being respectful of the three branches of government uh, and just correcting what we felt was a misapprehension of the General Assembly's intent. With that, I ask for a yes vote on the Judiciary Committee report. The question before us is the adoption of the committee report, Judiciary Committee report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The con Judiciary Report Committee report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Soper. Merci. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, in the bill, uh, what we're uh, trying to do is uh, what Representative Tipper eloquently explained, is to take Colorado's premises liability law back to where it was before the uh, Rocky Mountain Planned Parenthood case was decided. And there were two elements that are specifically in the bill that we're saying that the court in the future cannot rely on when looking at premises liability cases. So they can't look at the uh, foreseeability of the third-party criminal conduct based upon the goods or services offered by the landowner are controversial. And then that the landowner could be held liable as a substantial factor in causing harm without considering whether the third-party criminal act was the predominant cause of that harm. What we really don't want to have happen here in Colorado is a situation where churches or nonprofits or other organizations to protect against some unknown criminal actor coming in and creating a mass murder by having to install bulletproof glass, armed guards at the door, metal detectors. It would have a chilling effect on all of our nonprofits, all of our churches, you know, all, all of the institutions that make Colorado a great state. It would also make it to where insurance would go sky high through the roof. 
uh, you wouldn't be able to afford insurance uh, as, a, uh, as a business entity. And that's why uh, I believe and we believe that the Supreme Court was, was wrong, at least in this uh, narrow element of the case, and that it should not be relied on in the future. Any further discussion on Senate Bill 115, Representative Tipper? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the only other thing I'll add is that, uh, you know, just speaking candidly, it's a sad state of affairs that we even have to consider a bill like this. Um, but in the course of just the hearing that we had, there were several incidents um, in Denver, in Colorado, across the country where, you know, we're talking about supermarkets, tattoo parlors, as my co-prime said, synagogues, um, healthcare clinics. And if we are imposing liability on these business owners, then it's a fundamental unfairness. How could they foresee every possible permutation of an individual um, willing to commit such a heinous act? So this really restores the law to what it was before this specific ruling, and we ask for a yes vote on Senate Bill 115. The question before us is Senate Bill 115. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Hold on. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 115 is adopted. Uh, Mr. Shibo, please read the title of House Bill 1025. House Bill 1025 by Representative Benavidez, also Senator Kolker, concerning the repeal of infrequently used tax expenditures. Representative Benavidez. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I uh, move the Appropriations Bill um, Committee report and the finance. Finance first moved, or appropriation? I move House Bill uh, 221025 along with the um, committee reports. To the committee report. Okay. The appropriations, first, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. The appropriations report um, made no additional changes to the bill and just approved it. So the, I ask for approval of the uh, or. I move that the appropriations report be approved. The question before us is the adoption of the appropriations report. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The appropriations report is adopted. To the finance committee report. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members in finance, we removed one of the um, uh, tax expenditures from the bill, and I ask that the finance report be approved. The question be before us is the Finance Committee report. All those in favor, the adoption of the Finance Committee report. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The finance report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Madam Pro Tem, Speaker Pro Tem Benavides. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, members, this bill came out of our um, oversight committee this summer on uh, tax policy. And basically, we reviewed the um, analysis that was done by the Office of the State Auditor on tax expenditures. And they identified these eight tax expenditures as not being used at all or being used very little. As you can see, the, the fiscal note is very small, uh, less than 200000 So because these are not used, it's a measure to help clean up our tax code. So I would urge a yes vote. The question before us is House Bill 1020, the adoption of House Bill 1025. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1025 is adopted. Mr. Shebo, please read the title of House Bill 1093. House Bill 1093 by Representatives McCormick and Will, also Senator Smallwood and Zenzinger, concerning the conduct of charitable gaming activity and in connection therewith, modernizing the bingo and raffles law to accommodate the use of improvised electronic aids and device, improved electronic aids and devices in the conduct of games of chance. All right. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1093 and the Appropriations Report and the Business and Affairs and Labor Report. Thank you very much. To the Appropriations Report. In Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the Appropriations <coughs> Committee, um, 
They appropriated some money. The question before us is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Appropriations Committee report is adopted. To the Business Affairs and Labor report, Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. In Business Affairs and Labor uh, Committee, we amended the bill uh, and replaced language that would more accurately describe uh, the new bingo cards that are described in the bill and also removed sections pertaining to updating an electronic device used as aid in the playing of pull tabs. Uh, and with the amendment, um, we removed all opposition to the bill. I um, urge an I vote. The question before us is the adoption of the Business Affairs and Labor Committee report. All those in favor say aye. We got it. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The appropriation, uh, the Business Affairs and Labor Report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Will. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. Honor uh, to serve with you. Th this is a good bill, and it's uh, it, it really helps out our non our non nonprofits, and that's where uh, you know our charitable organizations. There's hundreds of them across this state, and uh, this bill's a this bill's a win for everyone. And uh, our, it was never our intent to uh, uh, compete with casinos or any of that. So um, we, this this bingo bill, it's uh, I think it's going to really help our non uh, or our uh, charitable organizations across this state. And we heard from a lot of those, and all the way from the vets to the uh, high school marching bands and and um, charter schools, all of them. So this is a good bill. Oh yes. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I know a lot of you even mentioned that you have volunteered at your local bingo halls and um, veterans organizations. I, I did want to um, make sure we knew when, when Representative Will said vets, he meant veterans, not veterinarians. And <laughs> that many of these nonprofits that depend on uh, these bingo games as a primary part of their fundraising efforts uh, annually have really suffered these last two years um, with the pandemic. And so in this bill, what, what it will do is allow the electronic aids that they presently use in bingo games that um, can carry 54 games will now be able to carry 50, 100 games. And so it just uh, allows them to have more games per one of these aids. And the other thing it does is adds a new type of bingo that is um, similar to playing like five cards of bingo at once, all on paper, not electronic. Um, and that's all the bill does. And so um, I Many of you have some of these organizations in your own uh, neighborhoods. They could be high school band boosters or uh, sports teams, um, many different uh, churches that uh, use these types of games to support their nonprofit uh, efforts. So I urge an I vote. Representative Will. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would uh, ask everyone to uh, vote yes on this bill before it's too late. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1093. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say B-I-N-G no. <laughs> Jeez. The ayes have it. The bill is adopted. Period. Hey. Hey. That's a, that's a first Mr. Sheeble, please read the title of House Bill 1098. House Bill 1098 by Representatives Byrd and Bake and also Senator Liston concerning the elimination of barriers to obtaining authority to practice an occupation based on an individual's criminal history record. Okay. Representative Bacon. Thank you. I move House Bill 1098 and the committee report. That's two committee reports. Appropriations and business affairs. To the appropriations report, Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Chair. And in the Appropriations Committee, we added an Appropriations Clause. I ask for a yes vote. The question before us is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Appropriations Committee report is adopted. To the Business Affairs and Labor Report, Representative Byrd. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. In the Business Affairs and Labor Committee, we amended the bill to um, allow the, Div the Division of Occupations and Licensing to create a pre-certification process rather than mandating that they just have one. So uh, we've directed a process there. We've also required that um, denials for an occupational license be documented in writing and um, also then included in a database so that future applicants can learn from past denials and um, also changed some process so that it is consistent with uh, process set forth in existing statute. The question before us is the, the question before us is the business affairs and labor report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The report is adopted. To the bill. Thank you, members. This is a great bill. Um, we are excited to be able to say that we may be able to support with some of our solutions in regards to two things, um, developing workforce and also redu reducing our recidivism rates. Uh, members, this bill pretty much asks DOLA to take a hard look at um, their practices around not issuing license for those who have a criminal background. Um, this bill is requiring that DOLA take a look at their practices, but also um, support members and our neighbors in being able to get occupational licenses, which are so important to be able to go to work these days by telling them um, if they are rejected, why, but also for us to collect data globally so that we can understand as a community um, how we can better get folks um, to these licenses, but also help with accountability um, that we find consistency around um, any rejections. And so ultimately, this bill um, will allow for more people to gain access to work, more people to find that dignity in work, um, and also be able to keep people from uh, reoffending. If people go to work and are able to provide for their families um, because their criminal record is no longer a barrier to work, um, we will definitely see it down um, the line where mo more people will be safe and will have less cost to the state and incarcerating folks. So we urge an I bill on 1098. Representative Byrd. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And I'll just add um, a statement. Honestly, members, everyone needs to find a way to contribute and earn a living. We all depend upon a strong economy. And to have a strong economy, people need to be able to work. And employers need a big, diverse, skilled pool of workers. Importantly, our laws should not create barriers to a person's ability to get a job and provide for themselves. For too long, barriers to getting a job have existed for too many. Our bill focuses on eliminating these barriers to work that exist for the specific population of people who have a criminal history record or who might otherwise have committed a crime and have paid their debt to society, but now they want to re-enter society as contributing members. Absent some compelling reason, we must not allow our laws to end regulations to stand in the way of a person's ability and right to get a job and to provide for themselves. This bill is an important step in this direction, and I, too, urge a yes vote. The question before us is House, the adoption of House Bill 1098. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1111. House Bill 1111 by Representative Amable, also Senators Rankin and Fenberg, concerning insurance coverage for insured losses incurred as a result of declared fire disaster. Representative Amable. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to move the, my bill, uh, House Bill 1111, the Appropriations Report, and the Business Committee Report. To the appropriations report. Uh, in the appropriations committee, we appropriated eighty thousand uh, dollars to for the division of insurance to check on the policies that get issued pursuant to this legislation and make sure that they are in compliance. The question before us is the adoption of the appropriations committee report. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, aye. no. The ayes have it. The Appropriations Committee report is adopted to the Business Affairs and Labor report. So in Business and Labor, we offered several amendments which brought the insurance industry and the proponents together and um, also worked with the Division of Insurance to make sure that we created a policy that was um, going to help people 
without raising rates and without uh, disrupting the insurance industry. I the, urge an I vote. The question before us is the. Uh, oh wait! Oh wait! But I have an amendment. Oh, oh. I, I'd also like to offer. <laughs> sorry about that. Amendment L006, uh, which is an amendment to the business committee report, and have it displayed. <gasps> Thank the you. amendment to the Business Affairs and Labor Report is properly displayed and, and meets the requirement of having been distributed prior to this. So tell us about the amendment, please, Representative Amabile. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, we did have a lot of amendments in the Business Committee, and so it was a little bit confusing. and. Um, this amendment is really just a cleanup amendment that makes sure that we got everything right and in the right place. Uh, it doesn't substantially change the bill. So I urge an I vote. The question before us is amendment L006 to the Business Affairs and Labor Report of House Bill 10, 11, 11. 10, 11, 11. Uh, All those in favor of the amendment L006, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The amendment, the ayes have it, the amendment is adopted. The question before us is now the Business Affairs and Labor Report as amended. All those in favor say uh, of adopting the Business Affairs and Labor Report as amended, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it tepidly, weekly, um, the ayes have it, the Business Affairs and Labor Report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Amabile. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, House Bill 1111 was motivated by the disaster that happened in Grand County, the East Troublesome Fire. And my colleague in the Senate and I had a town hall there in June, and we just heard some terrible stories of people who are really struggling to get a fair payout from their insurance company. Some people, almost a year later, still hadn't received any of the money that they felt they were owed. And um, they were fighting against a ticking clock that said, you have to have your house rebuilt within a year, and we are only going to pay you your alternative living expenses for one year. And yet they couldn't get the information that they needed to begin to contract with a contractor and get their home rebuilt. So um, that was the genesis of this bill. Um, the trauma of losing your home in a fire plays out in steps. First you learn you're underinsured. Then you learn you have to rebuild within a year where all the infrastructure is destroyed and all of your neighbors are competing with you for scarce resources. Then you're told, in order to recover more than the 30% statutory allowance for your contents insurance, you have to complete an arduous inventory where you write a detailed list of every single thing in your home. So if you look around this room, you would have to write, I had a water dispenser. I had a little name tag. I had some lamps. And you'd have to say what kind of lamp that was, where you bought it, and how much you paid for it, and what the brand of the lamp is. And for many people, especially older people, this turns out to be too much. So many people, the Division of Insurance supplied us with some data on how much different insurance companies actually paid out. And many people are not getting more than 30%, which is what you're, the companies are obligated to give you no matter what. So in this bill, it says they have to now give you 65% of your contents insurance, and they have to give that to you right away. And you can still do the inventory to get the rest, uh, and it also allows the division to streamline the process of submitting those inventories. So it makes it easier to get the rest of the money, too. The bill also says that now you have two years to rebuild, plus you can, if you can't rebuild and it's not your own fault, you get two six-month extensions on the rebuild timeframe. 
and two six months extensions on your alternative living expenses so that they match up, so that you get paid your alternative living expenses up until the day um, you get to move into your new house. It allows you to build or buy in a new location if you don't want to continue living where you were living. And it allows you to combine coverage. So if you had a barn and you had a shed and they were in a garage and everything was insured separately and you're underinsured, it allows you to combine all that coverage and build one new house with the money. The bill comes too late for the Marshall fire victims. But many of the companies have already agreed to pay out at least 60% of the contents because they know this legislation is coming and they know this is what they will be asked to do going forward. We worked really hard on this bill to get all the parties to the table and I don't think any of you have been lobbied against the bill. Um, I would urge you all to think about in your district you know, we, we were in Boulder, I think we thought, well, you know, that might happen in the western part of Boulder, but that's not going to happen in Louisville or Superior, but it turns out it did happen, and it could happen in your district, too. And these are common sense reforms, and I urge you to vote yes. Thank you. Representative Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in strong support of House Bill 1111, and uh, as uh, the chair of the committee where this bill came through, I wanted to publicly thank Representative Amabile for her work uh, in negotiating this very complicated issue. Uh, insurance, of course, is very complicated, and she did a fantastic job at bringing everybody to the table to arrive at uh, what I believe is a compromise. Uh, I also rise in strong support as somebody who represents communities that have been and will continue to be impacted by wildfire. And it used to be that those of us who were from the western slope or from more mountainous areas were the ones who had to think about wildfire in our districts. But now, as we saw with the Marshall Fire, I think everybody in this room needs to worry about wildfires in their district. And so I think this bill in front of us is probably one of the most important bills of this session. And I want to thank Representative Amabile again for her work on that. What's happening in this bill, if it wasn't made clear, is that Colorado is now going to be more than doubling the minimum amount uh, that is covered by insurance in a, in a total loss. It also is going to make Colorado a leader, along with another wildfire-impacted state, California, in recovery from wildfire losses. Um, this is, as I mentioned, an incredibly complicated bill, but it's one that is going to unfortunately not impact those who lost their homes in East Troublesome or in the Marshall fires, but unfortunately it will be applicable to many Coloradans in the future who will lose their homes from wildfire. And with passing this bill, we can at least say to our constituents in that future situation that we are doing everything we can to make sure they are made whole when they go through that terrible experience. So I'd ask for an I vote. Representatives Gray and Burnett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And as the representatives uh, of the areas that were devastated by the Marshall Fire, um, we are in strong support of this bill. Um, we, the folks who, in my district, um, who uh, were victims of the Marshall Fire, they buy, we buy homeowners insurance like you could have a you have a water leak or something like that. Like that's what you expect that you have your insurance for. You don't expect um, to get a reverse 911 call that says get out of your house right now, you're in danger, and to come back to a pile of rubble. Um, and once that happens, figuring out how to rebuild life for your for that that type of constituent is really really hard because it it was not something we planned for, and this. Representative Mabla is working on this issue before the Marshall Fire. She's been working on it for a long time, but it is really important because increased fires have become um, more of our way of life. And until we do more things to actually mitigate that, uh, it's gonna, the next Marshall Fire is going to come. And what we can do is we can take care of those folks. So again, Representative Mabla, this is... <laughs> has been working on this much longer than that and I appreciate the work so much it just didn't become as real a thing for me until the most destructive wildfire in the history of the state uh, came to our district so I want to say 
Um, very much strongly support this bill, and thank you so much for your work. Representative Burnett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for bringing this bill. I'm in strong support of it as well. Uh, after the initial um, evacuation, this was the biggest question that everybody had, and it was heartbreaking to tell people that we couldn't do anything to fix the problem with everybody having to document every single piece of um, property they have in their homes. And, but I could tell them that this bill was coming, and I so, I so appreciate that. This is just a start. There are so, of anything I've heard about, it is insurance that is the, the biggest issue. And this really raised people's concern that any, anybody can be affected by wildfires. And I can't, you know, I, so I just, I think this is just a start. But it's a huge, huge start on uh, fixing the problem and, and making sure that in the future people can recover more quickly from these horrible disasters. Thank you so much. Any further discussion on House Bill 1111? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1111. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1111 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1225. House Bill 1225 by Representatives Hooten and Will, also Senators Fenberg and Hawkes Lewis, concerning the continuation of the Colorado Re Resiliency Office in the Department of Local Affairs and in connection therewith, implementing recommendations contained in the 2021 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Representative Will. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. I move House Bill 22-1225. No that report. is great. Would you like to say more? Yes. So this bill is, uh, I guess no matter where you live in Colorado, you're impacted by disasters. We were just talking about with the last bill, the Marshall Fire, but, you know, to pandemics, to wildfires and drought, uh, the frequency and the severity of these natural disasters seem to be increasing. So. The Colorado Resiliency Office in the Department of Local Affairs helps Colorado communities adapt and thrive in the midst of these changing conditions. So uh, <clears throat> created in the aftermath of these fires and floods in 2012, the Colorado Resiliency Office coordinates long-term recovery efforts, connects communities with needed resources, supports communities to reduce the impacts of future disasters. The office also brings much needed resources to Colorado with 2.3 million federal funding planning grant award, and the office is working with 16 rural regional teams representing 170 communities to develop and implement recovery roadmaps. So, this is a this advances local economic resiliency and their priorities. Um, it's a good investment, positions the state to build these resilient communities that are safer, healthier, and able to adapt to changing conditions. This. Uh, this bill is, uh, it was set to sunset, and this is extends it for another 15 years uh, to 2037. Thank you. Representative Hooten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, um, I have to say that the, and you don't always see this in sunset reports from Dora, but this one was uh, pretty glowing about um, how well uh, the Resiliency Office is meeting its mission of not going in uh, to a, not only going into a community and helping them coordinate the federal, state, and local responses to an emergency, but also helping them to plan into the future about how to be more resilient. And, um, and so we had, you know, a lot of testimony around that, which was impressive. Uh, but in the sunset report at the end, the only recommendation that Dora had for this office is that they receive more funding for more personnel because they do such a great job and offer such a valuable service to Coloradans. So I urge a yes vote on House Bill 1225. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1225? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1225. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1225 is adopted. 
Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to lay over uh, House Bill 1286 one day. Thank you. Mr. Schiebel, please read 12, House Bill 1286 is laid over one day. Mr. Chief, will please read the title of 12, House Bill 1252. House Bill 1252 by Representative Burnett, also Senators Kirkmeyer and Hawkins Lewis, concerning provisions of public school contracts and in connection therewith, specifying requirements and limitations for such provisions. Representative Burnett. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1252 in the committee report. To the Education Committee report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the committee made an amendment uh, that says that if a contract neglects to include the required provisions specified in this bill, that those omitted provisions are deemed to be included. I urge an adoption of the committee report. The question before us is the Education Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Education Committee report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Burnett. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bipartisan bill saves schools time and money, protects schools from expensive litigation, and ensures that student data is protected by Colorado's data privacy laws. The problem is school districts contract with many vendors of goods and services, and many of those vendors are often headquartered in states other than Colorado. Those standard contracts have provisions that specify that the laws of the state where the vendor is headquartered apply, not Colorado's laws. If these contracts were violated and enforcement of the contract provisions is required, the case would be litigated in the state where the vendor is headquartered, not in Colorado. And the laws of that state would apply, not Colorado's laws. This means that Colorado's data privacy laws may not apply. School districts spend many hours reviewing and negotiating contracts, showing vendors why they have to change the contract to conform to Colorado state law, wasting a lot of time and money on legal work. Smaller districts may not have the legal service resources to evaluate these contracts as thoroughly as needed, exposing them to potentially costly leg lit litigation for contract violations, and student data data may be compromised. So what this bill does is it is modeled in part after the existing provisions of the state procurement code. It's limited to provisions of public school contracts. The thing, the bill automatically avoids provisions that require the school district to indemnify or hold harmless another person, to agree to binding arbitration or limited liability, and to provisions that waive the Colorado's uh, government immunity or student data privacy or security acts or anything that conflicts with Colorado law or regulation. The bill also requires the contract to have the following provisions, that any future compensation is paid contingent upon the money being appropriated and that the contractor pays all employment taxes, workman's compensation and unemployment insurance and complies with all federal, state and local laws. In closing, this bill will save schools time and money, protect schools from litigation, and protect student data privacy. I urge a vote of yes on House Bill 1252. Any further discussion on House Bill 1252? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1252. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1252 is adopted. Madam Majority, Assistant Majority Leader? No? Okay. <laughs> then Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1275. House Bill 1275 by Representatives McLaughlin and Larson, also Senator Fields, concerning the continuation of the School Safety Resource Center Advisory Board and in connection therewith implementing the recommendation of the Department of Regulatory Agency Sunset Report. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move House Bill um, 1275 on second reading. Properly moved. Further comments? Uh, this is a sunset bill. Uh, Dora came out in complete uh, favor of it. It is to um, keep addressing um, school security and safety for students um, in our schools. 
Representative Larson. Everything that Representative McLaughlin said. And I urge an I vote. <laughs> the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1275. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1275 <laughs> is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 26. Senate Bill 26 by Senators Janal and Kirkmeyer, also Representatives Basenecker and Rich, concerning an oil and gas operator's sole ability to review and protest property tax. Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you, sir. I move Senate Bill 22026 and the committee report. To the committee report. Representative Bazenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. In committee, we just added one amendment um, that was important um, at the recommendation of stakeholders and also our drafter. And we just added uh, a definition into section one of the bill that was also in section two. The question before us is the adoption of the Finance Committee report. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Finance Committee report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Bazenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this bill simply clarifies that a county assessor only needs to communicate any information regarding property valuation with an oil and gas operator and not to every fractional interest owner of that well. Um, there's a number of concerns as this bill came to us from the assessors in as much as they don't know who the fractional interest owners are. Um, the fractional interest owners don't have pertinent information that the assessor would need and that some oil and gas wells have uh, hundreds of fractional interest owners, which makes the process really untenable from our assessors. Representative Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill is consistent with the current practice for assessors in, in evaluating other real property. Stakeholder outreach on this bill has included conversations with the Colorado Oil and Gas Association, the Colorado Association of Mineral Right Owners, the American Petroleum Institute, and the Colorado Petroleum Association. No issues or concerns were identified. And I ask for an I vote. Representative Benavides. The question before us is Senate Bill 26, the adoption of. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of House uh, Senate Bill, adoption of Senate Bill 26 say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 26 is adopted. <laughs> Madam Assistant Majority Leader. Gonzalez Gutierrez. Oh. Mr. Schiebel, please read uh, the title to House Bill, Senate Bill 95. Yeah. Oh. Senate Bill 95 by Senators Fields and Moreno, also Representatives Gonzalez Gutierrez and Bacon, concerning improving missing persons investigations. Majority, Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 95 and the Judiciary Committee Report. To the Judiciary Committee Report. Representative Bacon. Thank you. In judiciary, we um, addressed a few tweaks to the bill and language in regards to um, the communities in which we'd like to see a report and some definitions. However, I do have an amendment as we need to amend the Judiciary Committee report. Representative Bacon. I move L6. And ask that it be and and one ask moment that while it we have uh, <laughs> the amendment has been properly displayed. Sorry. <laughs> I get all like Is there any discussion on amendment L006? Representative Bacon. Yes, so we'd just like to explain this really quickly. Um, the Judiciary Committee report initially we moved um, the definition of persons 50 years of age and older to another section. However, our drafter found that the citation we used for that definition was, is going to sunset. 
So we need to strike that. Also, he found um, in a section where we wrote about a, um, the Colorado, I'm sorry, uh, about the resource that we we're going to use to update data, it's incorrectly entered as a center instead of a database. Um, so ultimately, we need to reconfigure some language, and the suggestion was to strike the Judiciary Committee report and um, amend it so that we can see all the language referred here. The question before us is Amendment L006 to the Judiciary Committee report. All those in favor of Amendment L006, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Amendment L006 to Judiciary Committee report passes, is adopted. To the committee report, as amended. We Representative now, Bacon. We now move that the committee report as amended is adopted. The question before us is a Judiciary Committee report as amended. All those in favor say aye. All, aye. Those, op all those opposed, no. <laughs> the ayes have it. Judiciary Com Committee report as amended is adopted okay. to the bill. <laughs> Representative Bacon. Thank you. Member, Senate Bill 95 um, does something that we've worked alongside the Department of Public Safety to be able to put a spotlight on the missing persons um, here in Colorado. Um, it is a really great bill in regards to making it easier to report people missing across the state. It also requires that Department of Public Safety report out through smart committees the data that they find in regards to those um, who are missing. With paying attention, paying specific attention to um, missing women in minority communities as well as those in the older um, community. An older community is defined as persons over 50 years of age. Um, again, this bill also says that um, in specifics in regards to reporting, Anybody in Colorado can report someone missing, even if they're not in that jurisdiction where someone went missing from. Anybody in Colorado can report someone missing um, if, they were, if that person was even believed to be in Colorado um, before they were missing. Um, the bill also says, uh, creates some circumstances to which law enforcement does not have to take a missing person's report. And that is if we cannot prove um, some sort of nexus between the person who's reporting someone missing gone either through the action or a relationship. Lastly, um, the bill does pay a lot of attention to missing children and requires that once most, in most cases, once children are regarded as missing, that it be immediately or um, reported to law enforcement with two, within two hours and the descriptions of those who are described as missing go to the Colorado, go to a Colorado um, database that all law enforcement jurisdictions have access to as well as for missing children to the National Center of Missing Children. Um, so again, we um, are grateful to the Department of Public Safety um, for making it easier to look for and care for um, our missing persons in this state and to remove the barriers so that they can be found sooner. Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. All good? Okay. Um, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 95. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 95 is adopted. <laughs> Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the committee rise and report. You have heard the motion. Seeing no objection, the committee will rise and report.
The House will come back to order. Mr. Schiebel, please read the report of the Committee of the Whole. Madam Speaker Pro Tem, your Committee of the Whole begs leave to report us in consideration the following attached bills, being the second reading thereof and making the following recommendations thereon. House Bill 1025 is amended, 1093 is amended, 1098 is amended, 1111 is amended, 1224 is amended, 1225, 1252 is amended, 1275, pass on second reading in order and gross and place on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senate Bill 20, 26 is amended, 92, 95 is amended, 115 is amended, passed on second reading in order revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bill 1286, laid over until March 16, 2022. House Bill 1095 is amended, lost on second reading. Thank you, Mr. Shebo. Uh, Representative Froelich. You've heard the motion. There are an amendment at the desk. Uh, Mr. Shebo, please read the Lantine Amendment to the Committee of the Whole. Representative Lantine moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in not adopting House Bill 1095 to show that House Bill 1095 as amended passed. Thank you. Representative Lantine. Uh, thank you, members. Um, we have heard not one but two second reading debates on House Bill 1095. And I believe that a bill of that magnitude to this body deserves a recorded vote. And so I am asking you all to take a recorded vote and not let this die without having your name next to a vote. And for that reason, I ask for a yes vote on my amendment to say that House Bill 1095, as amended, did pass. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the Lantine Amendment to the Report of the Committee of the Whole? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Lantine Amendment to the Report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Shee will please open the machine, and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Van Winkle, how do you vote? No. Representative Van Winkle votes no. Representative Neville, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Neville votes yes. Representative Williams, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Williams votes yes. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Representative Sandridge, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Sandridge votes yes. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? No. Representative Ortiz votes no. Representative Hanks, how do you vote? Please mark Representative Hanks excused. Please close the machine. With 28 aye votes, 35 no votes, and two excused, the Lantine Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole is lost. The question before us is the, there's no more amendments of the desk, correct? No more amendments at the desk. Uh, the question before us is the adoption of the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Van Winkle, how do you vote? No. Representative Van Winkle votes no. Representative Neville, how do you vote? No. Representative Neville votes no. Representative Williams, how do you vote? No. Representative Williams votes no. Representative Sandridge, how do you vote? No. Representative Sandridge votes no. Representative Ortiz, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ortiz votes yes. Please close the machine. With 41 aye votes, 22 no votes, and two excuse, the report of the Committee of the Whole is adopted. Um, I think that brings us to announcements and introductions. Representative Kipp. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, if any of the women in the House would like to join me, we are going to just um, say a couple of words about Equal Pay Day. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> So, members, 
I, I know we have to get off to committee, so I just want to um, read this, but and thank you for joining me down here. Um, so today is Equal Pay Day. Equal pay is a matter of justice, fairness, and dignity. It is about living up to our values and who we are as a nation. For over 25 years, Equal Pay Day has helped draw attention to gender-based pay disparities by highlighting how far into a new year a woman must work on average to earn what a man did in the previous year. This year, Equal Pay Day falls on March 15th, the earliest we have ever marked the occasion. The earlier that equal pay day arrives, the closer our nation has come to achieving pay fairness. But while we should celebrate the progress we have made, as I have said in the past, or as has been said in the past, we should not be satisfied until equal pay day is no longer necessary at all. In 2020, the average woman working full-time year-round for wages or a salary earned 83 cents for every dollar paid to their average male counterpart. And once again, the disparities are even greater for black women who mark this date on September 21st, Native American women who mark the date of equal pay on November 30th, and Latina women who mark it on December 8th, and certain subpopulations of Asian women when compared to white men. Disabled women also continue to experience significant disparities and make 80 cents for every dollar compared to men with disabilities. The pay gap reflects outright discrimination as well as barriers that women face in accessing good paying jobs and meeting caregiving responsibilities, including a lack of affordable childcare, paid family and medical leave, and fair and predictable scheduling, which often prevent women from joining and staying in the workforce. Over the course of a career, the pay gap can add up to hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost earnings, particularly for women of color, significantly impacting retirement savings and uniquely burdening households led by single mothers. So something to celebrate that today is the earliest we've ever celebrated it, but we got work to do. Thank you, everyone. Additional announcements and introductions. Representative Sirota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services Committee will be meeting at 1.30 in room 112 to hear House Bill 1267, Senate Bill 79, and House Bill 1268. Any other announcements or introductions? Seeing none, Majority Leader Eskar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the House stand in recess until later today. Seeing no objection, the House will stand in recess until later today. Thank you. 